Peter and Sue um, do a great deal of research into sacred sites and a lot of traveling around the country. And uh, they also use music to, as they describe it, to re-enchant the land. And of course, the chant is to make songs. So to enchant is such a beautiful, beautiful thing to do. And they're going to tell us all about that. So ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to Peter Knight and Sue Wallace. Thank you. Thank you. Right, can you all hear us? Yes. yes. Can, you, can you hear me? Because I'm very quietly spoken. Well done, yes. Eyes down for a full house. Oh, that's a different <laughs> evening. Right, okay. So uh, it's great to be back here again and uh, as part of this wonderful event. Thanks, Andy, for uh, another insightful talk, wonderful stuff. Um, this talk is based, we've got an hour to shove something I I together that was, uh, could easily go on twice that length uh, because it's all about our inspiring land of Albion. And it's based on our new book, Albion Dreamtime. Uh, all things begin and end in Albion's ancient druid rocky shore, William Blake said. And uh, our book tells the story of our personal quest to re-enchant uh, this sacred isle at this very pivotal time of climate change. So just for people who don't know us, we are two people with a passion for the earth. And for a, a reconnecting people with the land. We host wilderness weekends, day events, shamanic gatherings such as in caves, and we host the annual convention of archaeology and earth mysteries. So I'll be in Dreamtime is my 11th book and Sue's uh, second. And uh, please, if you like what you hear today and if you're passionate about the earth and earth healing, please join the Facebook Albion Dreamtime page. So enough of us. Um, we thought a nice connection um, from Andy's talk would be actually be um, pointing out what we feel is, is, is wrong in terms of, uh, you know, how we got to this state environmentally. Um, farming arrived in the Neolithic, arguably the worst thing that man ever invented in, in terms of the climate. And of course it led to deforestation. It led to land ownership. Land is now somebody's property. And nature has to be controlled. Stone sites were erected. One of the reasons they were erected to, is to enhance productivity, of course, in the land. And science uh, has ever seek to deprive nature of her spirit. And of course, that's led to controlling politics, which Andy very eloquently spoke about. And we're now in an, an environmental emergency, you may have noticed. The governments are being far too slow to act. And all the conspiracy theories will amount to absolutely nothing if the planet is no longer able to support humanity. So as a species, we've lost our way. And personally, we often feel the pain of the Earth. So personally, we have turned to the land for solace and guidance and truth. We're not aware that the land and the spirit of the land has ever lied to us. That's not what it does. It'll say it as it is. So this is how we cope with the bonkers mental madness of the world, which uh, Andy speaks about. Mm -hmm. So our quest has been to seek out, out Albion's original sacred places, all of which are natural. Before any stone circles were ever erected, all the places we held as sacred were natural ones, such as waterfalls, rock features, ravines, caves, and ancient forests. And we want to return to simplicity because we've overcomplicated our spirituality and our lives. We want to return to some kind of primal awareness, how we all used to be long before it was brainwashed out of us. We want to develop an environmental spirituality. So Albion Dreamtime had to be this joint venture of the balance of yin and yang, the, t the two of us working on the project together. Because if there's one thing that nature teaches you, uh, it's that it likes to have yin and yang in balance. You could say that's the Earth's job description. It seeks to create balance wherever it can. And the only time you don't see balance, usually of any description in the planet, is when we've rolled up. So we seek to connect with the hunter-gatherer pioneers of Albion, this sacred land, uh, the spirituality of the Neanderthals and the Mesolithic people. 
they're not primitives. They actually had something that we've lost, and that's this close personal relationship with the land. They lived in a symbiotic relationship with the earth. They only took what they needed. Isn't that a lesson for us today? But from the Neolithic, people took what was necessary to live as farmers, and that is a distinct difference. So there's plenty of evidence for spirituality prior to the Neolithic, that Neanderthals had a spiritual context, and certainly that the Mesolithic people uh, had a sense of spirituality. Um, it was times when nature provided and spirit guided. We all once had the sensibility of a shaman. Everybody once had that feral connection with the earth, but of course, once farming came along, and arguably just before that, we've handed our power over to a ritual specialist called the shaman. And, um, you know, that was, could be argued was of necessity because we're not hunter-gatherers anymore. We're now generally all in one place, which is not good for us. So symbolic landscapes is one of the key uh, factors of the dream time. We studied the Aborigines of Australia and the, and the Native Americans, and they all believed that the earth was created by the gods and beings, the creator gods. And myths are inscribed on the land, even today. So it's the landscape that gifts the stories. Isn't that a wonderful concept? People don't invent myths and stories. We are gifted them from the land when we attune with the land. What a wonderful concept. And the landscapes are imprinted with memory. And the one thing any Aboriginal will tell you is that the dream time is still now. Because if anything, the dream time is the concept of no time. And you see the wonderful images on there, the bottom two images there. I could easily perhaps fool you that those are two wonderful anthropomorphic rocks uh, in the outback of Australia, but actually uh, they're both in England. Ooh, oh, I like that. Ooh. 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 <laughs> I said they'd be nice to you. Um, this is Sue's ver first... Uh, big talk. Big talk in front of a conference. I think we ought to have a special welcome just for Sue. Oh. I don't know if I'm more nervous about standing in front of this conference again or being nervous about Sue's nervousness, but uh, <laughs> you'll be fine. So yes, those are all around us in Albion, and we were seeking out these dream time places so we don't have to go to Australia or Yosemite Park and things like that. It's all around us. And there were giants in the earth in those old days. That's from the Bible. So here we have Carnbray, the giant, in Cornwall. Um, and bottom we have Watton Tor. So what did the ancient people make of those two giants facing up to each other? And the one we see on the far right is a giant uh, spirit of place, shall we say, that we spotted underneath the waterfall as it pours over the cliff into St. Audrey's Bay in Somerset. So uh, when I was doing the Dartmoor Mindscapes book, I soon spotted that a lot of the stone circles, a lot of the alignments and the stone rows on Dartmoor are lined up with the natural sacred places because that's where the gods are residing, that's where the ancestors are living. And uh, there is a little section in the new book about that. Top right, you can see how the, the, the two major stones at uh, Merivale are actually aligned on the, on the tour, and there's lots of examples I found about this. Uh, the bottom picture, you can all see the face in the rock there. Yeah, and uh, that's that the space in front of it has been cleared, um, you know, to make it a ritual setting. And, the, and my right foot is standing on an altar with a rock basin. My left foot, this stone has been raised, this stone that looks like a serpent coming out of the land, and is resting on a spherical ball. So, you know, officially these are natural features, but you can't tell me this wasn't a hunter-gatherer sacred place. Once upon a time, long, long ago, there was an enchanted land called Albion. That's the first words in our book. Somehow it needed to start like a fairy tale. Because this is the land of giants, the Fae, dragons, Eartha, Merlin, and Gwynup Neath. Myths are draped across Albion and are usually associated with very specific natural places. The land will actually communicate with you if you sit and listen with an open heart. So Albion is the land of myths. Wow, is there any corner of Albion that is not absolutely stuffed full of myth? And I think this, this evolved from early people seeking to explain through stories their world about them and their experiences. 
So we sought out Albion's mythologized landscapes. So how are Dreamtime stories birthed? Because they, they certainly were being told uh, in Britain long ago. Perhaps through simulacra, uh, anthropomorphic rocks, trees that resemble something. We've all seen clouds that look like dragons, and we've seen trees and rocks. The one on the right is the crone rock at Hound Tor. Again, that's in Devon. And uh, the pulse of the earth energies, they were perhaps dowsing and naturally feeling uh, the serpent energies of the earth as it flows across the landscape. And of course, shamanic journeying, where you're journeying with intent to go to other dimensions and to contact other beings on the landscape. Ancient people would have been regularly in contact with the elementals. And what would they have made of natural phenomena, such as storms, that, that wonderful thunderstorm we had um, just earlier like this week? What would they have made of rainbows, fog, the moon's phases? They would have made up stories and myths about this. So wisdom from the land is absorbed via osmosis, subconsciously. As I said, if you listen to the land with an open heart, it will speak to you. So there's another wonderful example, the speaking crone. And you see her opening her mouth to speak. I mean, perhaps when the shaman had a few magic mushrooms inside him thousands of years ago, perhaps, he, perhaps she did speak. So again, uh, they're all around us. And dragons, here be dragons. We, we were on our quest doing the new book. We came across dragons all the time. There's a lot of uh, light coming on the screen, but I think you can see uh, the dragons in the clouds there and in the fire. This is how myths are birthed. And it's often amazing how often we, we, we tuned into the dragons of the land that they turn up to kind of say goodbye to us in the clouds at the end of the day. Look at the top, the top one there. The, the, can you all see it? The drinking dragon on the Isle of Man. So you can see where folklore of dragons is perpetuated because people are still seeing it in the landscape. And the uh, bottom left is a, is a natural dragon on Dartmoor. And Durdle Door, some of you might have been to, that's also known locally as the drinking dragon. So you can see how myths are perpetuated in geographical features. Caves. Caves. Caves is one of our special places. Um, we visited several on our quest. So you're going into the womb of the Earth Mother, this dark, liminal place. A place of fear, of the unknown. Is there a wild animal in there? Is the, the floor going to give way in the darkness? Is the roof going to cave in on me? It was a very personal, terrifying fear for me going into caves. But I think I've cracked it. Um, there was also lots of cave art from ancient times in a lot of, of these caves usually really, really deep, long way down into the caves, and always in the acoustic hotspots. And this was one of the things that helped me to get over my fears, doing chanting and singing. And we'll come on to that just shortly. Nature's full of wonderful metaphor and allegory. You know, the cave you fear to enter holds the treasure you seek. Go beyond your comfort zone where magic awaits. And the sound we found, not originally, but it, it soon became really important, didn't it? Yeah. Because I was enchanting in these caves, purely, partly to calm myself down, but also because the acoustics were so incredible that I could chant and hear my voice coming back at me with all these echoes. But it also seemed to change the energy of the place. So a place that we might turn up to that didn't seem very nice at first. If I chanted, it would change it completely and then became much more welcoming. And each place revealed its own unique song because I would always listen to what the cave wanted and it would give me a, just a little short phrase of a few notes that I would then just hum back very gently and gently drumming. And it, it was like it was the signature for that spirit of place. And often when we left that particular place, we couldn't remember the tune afterwards. It like our memory had been wiped. Or senior moment. It's a senior moment, yes, maybe. <laughs> it's, it's as if we we're not allowed to use that song anywhere else. It was that personal signature, wasn't it, of the, 
mm. of the place. And what you see in the bottom left uh, left hand picture there right. is actually just me playing rock music by picking up a few pebbles. If we'd been on a long journey and hadn't taken drums with us, just just tapping on the, the wall of the cave would often create in very unique sounds. And we think this was done thousands of years ago. We rock really music. Know. Rock music, yes. Um, wilderness. Uh, there's still wilderness in Britain, in Albion, sure. You go to parts of Dartmoor, around the coast of uh, the southwest. You go to Wales. You go to the Highlands or Scot central Scotland. You can, you can walk for days without meeting anybody, you know. And uh, so wilderness is, you suddenly get this sense of spaciousness. It's a bit edgy. What's the weather going to do next? It can change really quickly, and it can be challenging. It gets you out of your comfort zone, and that can often be where the magic happens. You know, when, when the ancients and tribal people of today, you know, go on a vision quest, it's no, it's not all fluffy bunnies. It's meant to be difficult. It's meant to be hard, and hopefully you come through the, uh, uh, the other side uh, changed. And that's what wilderness, I think, does to us. It was once said to seek wilderness is to seek wholeness. There's just one example of one of our sites, the fairy pools in sky. Oh, what a place. Wild nature, we say, where I go to lose my mind, find my soul. The enchantment of water. Water is essential for life. If it wasn't for water, we wouldn't be here. It's very special stuff. And springs, these liminal entrances to the underworld, where fresh water just bubbles up straight out of the earth. It's magical. How, how, well, how does it work? It's incredible. I mean, without going into all the technical stuff about geology, it is magical. And water holds memory. We all know that from homeopathy and from the work of Masaru Emoto. Water is so special. It has this cycle of water that is the metaphor for our lives, from the springs to the rivers to the oceans, evaporation and clouds, and then back as rain. Water is really special. And all of our places that we visited, such as the springs and waterfalls, have this life-affirming negative ions that just make you feel good. So a lot of um, Japanese medical people at the moment are recommending that we go to waterfalls purely for the benefits for good health. Okay. And here you see me on the, on the left here trying to chant, which was a bit tricky against the noise of a waterfall. Um, but the top right one is at the Fairy Glen in North Wales. Beautiful place. And I was mesmerized just by the bubbles and the, and the surf that was moving across the top of the water, constantly changing and morphing into other things. It was like a, a dragon one minute, and then it would turn into a, maybe a, a rabbit or a hare or, or a wolf and then it would be off again. It was, a, like a, it was giving me a lot of messages of what I should be doing, perhaps. Just to sit and watch. That's Wonderful. Some of our sites, the, uh, the bottom right there, the, the uh, water actually disappears into the void of a cave, you know, into, back into the Mother Earth. Very magical places. Uh, perhaps this could be a, a new strap line for this conference. We love this one we found. Truth is like a waterfall. It cannot be silenced. Yay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's a, a, one of my favorite pictures I've ever taken of Sue, which is in the book. We've been up to see this huge waterfall in Scotland. And uh, Sue came down and uh, did her, uh, her usual thing of blessing and thanking the waters. Mm -hmm. And I just saw this one shot of just Sue with this vast landscape behind her. You always bless the waters, don't I, you? I feel that wherever we go, we need to be so grateful for our water. Because basically, we've been trashing it, haven't we? Poisoning it. So we need to be grateful for our water. And I bless it every time we're near any kind of water. Trees. Where do we start with trees? Again, they're essential for life. They give us oxygen to breathe. And they're, they're, they are the... Um, the conduit between heaven and earth, like the world tree. We, we included four ancient forests in our book on our quest. It's difficult to, to actually um, pinpoint ancient forests because obviously 
they've, they've changed over the years. Um, but we've got two yew forests and two oak forests and these wonderful wisdom keepers, these ancient trees, we must preserve them and look after them. There's a couple of wonderful creatures that we spotted in our trees. Can you see them? Yeah, yeah. good. The yew dragon and uh, the little dryad who's uh, sitting on there, there's his, his eye and his face, just mm -hmm. like this wood lizard and uh, you know, um, Nature is wonderful in, in, in creating these forms for us. And uh, a scientist once said to a, a Native American elder, aren't these just coincidence? You know, nature just uh, you know, creates these things that we see things in. And he said, well, what would be the point of great spirit sending us images we would not recognize? Mm -hmm. Good answer. We've had a lot of close up and personal uh, encounters with wildlife, haven't we? When, mm -hmm. when you get into this zone and this space, wildlife knows your intent and it'll come right up to you. It's quite, that's some magical encounters. Uh, top left is uh, one where a deer, uh, literally, it's one of my totem animals, literally walked within feet of me. It knew it had nothing to fear. And often, bottom left, we often have birds of prey and kites just circling us very curiously uh, what we're up to. And I had an interesting encounter with a lizard that ran across my path and then decided to perch on my boot. And he was there for at least a couple of minutes. So he obviously had an interesting message for me. And at the bottom there, you see this beautiful beetle just wandering across our path. And we waited to see that it would just cross the path safely so that he didn't get trodden on if anyone else came along. Yeah, being a beetle, we wondered whether it was a reincarnation of John Lennon, didn't we, originally? <laughs> Sorry. Um, so again, we, we, we've, the book is massive with 800 pictures and 356 pages. We go to lots of places. We can only share a little snippet here to give you some idea uh, of the flavor. Uh, we divide the, uh, the country up, as you can see, into rainbows uh, to make it very accessible. And on the right, you see each area has its own little map. All natural sites, all what's in the list and what's not was, what not was what's interesting. We didn't include anywhere we felt was overmanaged, anywhere that gets overrun with tourists, anywhere we felt that was too dangerous for the, the general public. Um, and, um, you know, just anything that was spoiled. We were looking for pristine places that have survived, that we knew our ancient ancestors were going to. So the thing is, it's our personal list, isn't it? Mm. And we're encouraging you, once you've seen our list, to make your own list. Just find that little special place where you can go and commune with nature. So starting in the southwest, we'll just give you a little flavor from, from uh, each, each area, really. Of course, one thing that would probably be on everybody's list is Merlin's Cave at Tintagel. Yeah. So in Merlin's Cave, it's for, for those of you who don't know, it's a cave down on the shoreline. Um, it has an entrance to, uh, both ways, so it's like a tunnel, huge. Go at low tide, otherwise you can't get in. Um, and it has a, obviously a very wet feel to it at the bottom because of the tide going out. But the most amazing energy is going through. It's a really special place. And from the inside, as you can see from that top picture, you can actually see the waterfall cascading across the cliff and down onto the beach. As we came out this particular time, we also saw this uh, creature in the cliff below. Can you see what we saw was a dragon? Maybe we just got dragons on our brain, but we could see this quartz um, figure in the cliff. And this is about six, seven foot long, and it's actually prominent, it sticks out from the rock just flying across, and it almost looks as if it has a, a bow wave at the front, where it's flying from left to right. And Pete was gifted the dragon's heartbeat while we were there.
At the cheese ring in Cornwall, many of you have probably been to the hurlers. Um, you may have walked further on to the cheese ring. Incredible place. What did the ancient people make of these rocks all piled up on one on top of the other? I always think the giant, they might have thought the giants were playing Jenga. Mm, something like that. Something like that. Because uh, We had an interesting encounter with a raven, didn't we? The mm. raven, I think, spotted us coming. And he was circling around and just obviously wondering what we were up to. And he circled around us for at least an hour, going from perch to perch to perch, all the way around us, keeping an eye on us. Um, at one point, we were sitting for quite some time on one of these rocks as a, just to have our picnic. And I realized that we'd actually sat on one of his favorite perches. I could tell from the bird poop all over the rock. Um, so I had a little conversation with it and said that we were sorry that we were taking up his space and he was okay about it. Another magical place that not many of you might know of is uh, just off the Devon coast called Thurston Arch. It's this massive big rock arch, very dream time, very uh, imaginative, and it's, it, it, it's cut off at high water, but at low water, you can paddle out there in about a foot of water. So magical, and all these colored rocks and trees and limpets and seaweed. It's like you're being purified. It's like you're being cleansed by the sea uh, before you even get there. And, and you only realize how big it is when you actually get there. And uh, it's absolutely incredible. The energy flowing through that arch was, was amazing, wasn't amazing. it? Amazing. And as you can see from me standing there, the water was like a mill pond. And this is the sea, 300 meters out from the, from the shore. It was an astonishing time. We planned to get, sorry, we planned to get there at low tide, didn't we? And we got there at the exact minute of low tide. I love it when things like that happen. It, so. it was as if we'd been blessed with something really special here. And we spent quite some time here chanting um, and just observing and listening. And then we realized that the tide was turning. You could see that the, the waves in the, in the reeds and the seaweed were starting to move. So we, we headed back towards the shore, which took quite some time because it was about 300 meters. And then as we got back to the shore, having been really focused on where we were treading, we then turned and this sea mist had rolled in. We couldn't see the arch from the shore at all. And this view we actually saw once we got up on the cliffs back at the car park. And you can just about make out the top of the arch just above the dragon's breath. Magical. I think places also don't just possess a sacred presence, they also possess a sacred time when, thing, when the magic happens. So Wisman's Wood. Oh, where do you begin with Wisman's Wood? One of the ancient remains of the oak forests of Dartmoor. Loads of glitter, granite rocks, these, these dwarf oak rocks. Uh, very, very sacred place, atmosphere, folklore to do with Hearn and that sort of thing. We went and did a ceremony there, didn't we? Mm -hmm. Doing two antlers which represented the yin and yang. Fern laden. Oh, what a magical place that is in Dartmoor. And it's uh, full of nature spirits too. It's wonderful. We spent some time by this portal stone, this big triangular stone. Um, and there was this stunted tree next to us that looks a bit like an, an ent or something. And I spent some time just meditating with it. And I could actually see a face, but it had no mouth. And somehow I got the message that the trees cannot speak for themselves. We have to speak for them. We have to fight their cause and stand up for them. Stop, keep cutting them down. So I also, uh, top right, I also did a, a meditation. I've tuned into this stone a few times and got various things, uh, you know, and you don't always get the sort of thing that starts a religion, you know, thank goodness. Um, and what the stone told me that day, well, actually, this portal is not an entrance to another world, rather a tool to open your heart in this world. And that's, that's the key. I think, you know, people are trying to, you know, stand on the top of the tour, hoping the mother earth, the mothership's going to land at any minute, you know. If you weren't meant to be on this earth at this time to do what you've got to do, you wouldn't be here. So uh, this is the only planet of choice. Lidford Gorge, this is your... 
Lidford Gorge has been have been one of my sacred special places for probably about 30 years. It's run by the National Trust, but it's very sensitively run. Okay, so I'll give it, you that. It's very natural, it's beautiful. And a little tip, the gate isn't locked at night. There's nobody from the National Trust here, is there? <laughs> so you can go in there into nighttime. So you can sneak in after, after they've closed the office. And this is the most incredible place. It's, it's a really deep gorge that's heavily wooded, has a, the White Lady waterfall at one end, and at the other end, it has something called the Devil's Cauldron, where the water has come in and worn away the rocks in these massive circular pools with thunderous water. It's incredible. So we, we did some night visits there, didn't we? Uh, which are totally magic, because as you say, you can stay in there overnight if, if you wish. And while well, you really feel that you're being watched, that the elementals are all around you. And of course, we invited them in, and uh, we, as well as asking permission to go in there. And you went in for a paddle, mm -hmm. as you invariably do. Um, and uh, I screamed. I screamed when I walked into the water. And he said, oh, is the water cold, So I went, well, yes. But there's something more. It's the pain of the water. I could feel the pain of the water coming right through my body. As I said before, the water is really special and we really must look after it. I could feel the pain of the water through my feet. Okay, a place not far from here is Avalon's Hole. Anybody from Glastonbury or this area ever been there? It's a real hidden gem. Whoa, it's probably half hour from where you're all sitting in the Mendips and it's original we tried to, to seek out the, uh, the places of the ancestors and this is still supposed to be regarded as Britain's first official burial site it's a Mesolithic burial site and you go down into this dark void you go down about a 45 degree slope over some big boulders you know that's the initiation that's a rites of passage why should it be easy you know but when you get down there wow the acoustics are absolutely uh, incredible and uh, we're tuning in and we're kind of flickering our torches on all these shapes on the ceiling to replicate fires to flaming you know flaming fires and then uh, we looked up and then this, this one was just just took our breath away mm. Ooh. Ooh. you know that's about that, that, that cave spirit is about seven feet long and um, still dripping Still dribbling at the one end there, <laughs> but uh, you know things like this and possibly even that one were around when our Mesolithic hunter-gatherer uh, ancestors visited the cave. So it's like things are frozen in no time, you know, in no time. They're there. We can get glimpses uh, of what our ancestors are looking at, and we were gifted that incredible image, which uh, which shows up even even better, obviously, in the in the book. So, squid ear idra. Oh, God, I've probably made a mess of that in Welsh. Um, there's some waterfalls we have in South Wales uh, that you can actually stand behind. What an experience that is, to stand behind a thundering waterfall and ha on a ledge and have all the water cascading in front of you it, it is quite mind-blowing, and it really clears your aura. But we, we go to the same place twice and have different experiences, don't we, Sue? Mm. So in, in one picture there, you see me in a T-shirt, nice hot summer's day, and it was really refreshing to actually walk through a, a slight shower and get behind the waterfall to greet this amazing power. And then in the next picture, you see we'd visited in the winter. The water was much heavier. The, the clouds, the mist of, of water that was coming up as it bounced on the, the rocks. We were absolutely drenched, but still an amazing, exhilarating experience, and I highly recommend it. But this is a rite of passage place. You know, We know as we're standing there that somebody was standing there 10,000 years ago doing the same thing. Most definitely a shamanic location. So again, hope these show up OK in the... Uh in the lighting here. Caves, again, the Devil's Gorge cave in, Nor in North Wales was a, a big problem, a uh, big challenge for you. But, uh, you know, uh, you, you, you 
didn't want to go down uh, originally. There's this massive cave entrance. It goes down 40 feet, and it goes off into total darkness. Even we didn't go down to, to the, the very bottom. Um, but it reminded me of, a, of, a, of a, some of the a part of Star Wars, the second film, I think, where, where Luke is about to go into that cave, isn't he, to meet his past, if you like. And Luke says, what's in there? And Yoda says, only what you take in with you. Hmm. What a wonderful scene. So it's all about, uh, for Sue, personally, it was about going through your, your fears, wasn't it? Yes, yeah, you can see there's quite a lot of fresh rock fall. Where, um, and it took me about... 20 minutes to actually venture about that far down. <laughs> but I did finally get further down into the, this cave. It's a massive cave inside, and it echoed like a cathedral. It was beautiful to we, sing it. We timed the echoes from the drum and the chanting at six seconds. That is an extremely long amount of time. And uh, we haven't got time to do it today, but we're doing this talk at the Glastonbury PLG in September, and we're going to play three videos from our cave inventions there, because obviously there's not a, a time limit on that, so please join us then. But the acoustics in, in these womb spaces are incredible. A bit like, you know, the White Spring, the acoustics there are pretty cool, aren't they? But you come down into this place, wow. So another cave. King Arthur's Cave in the Y Valley, not too far from here. We do drumming sessions here uh, with groups, so you can sign up and come along. Uh, it's an Ice Age cave. Obviously, the name, there's Arthurian folklore there to do with Merlin and buried treasure. Uh, one of the places Arthur might still be. It's amazing how many of those are still around, isn't it? Arthur's all over the country. So um, it, it, it's a very, very special place. And uh, there's a side chamber, which is pitch black, unless you illuminate it. And Sue is there, standing in this pitch black chamber. And you can see on the wall there, again, in the book, they are clear out. You can see there's these, these spirits just hanging there on the wall. And uh, on one of our visits, I wasn't getting anything through at all. So, as often happens, we, we go our separate ways when we're at a sacred site. Um, so, um, after we had growled bear growls, and uh, howled like wolves, uh, we then uh, have a quiet time. Sue goes off into the dark chamber to gently drum and chant, and I sit in the main chamber and tune in. Um, a bit frustrated I was. Are you here, Arthur? Are you here, I ask. The reply is immediate. I, Arthur, am here. And will be as long as you remember me, for I am the spirit of the land, the spirit of Albion. My heart opens as Sue continues to chant and drum, unseen in the other chamber. What should I do, I ask? Do as you are doing. For as long as people re-enchant my name out in my sacred land, then one day the spirit of Albion will surely rise again. I reply, thank you. And at that exact moment, Sue in the other chamber falls silent. So she had been the voice and the drum that had woken spirit, and I had merely been the scribe, if you like. And all of a sudden, the trees, there was a rush of air, wasn't there? And all the trees rustled, you know, rustled outside, you know, as if in acknowledgement. It was quite a magical time, and it's the sort of time all of you can have. Thor's cave, another cave, uh, wow, massive, uh, near Ashbourne, Peak District. And uh, it's like walking into the body, the carcass of a dragon or some huge dinosaur. And uh, all the chambers, uh, there's some side chambers, which often look like the eyes of skulls. And we wandered around and we wandered around. An absolutely massive place associated with Thor because often loud clapping sounds were heard in there in the past. And um, it was during a, uh, a, a real drought, wasn't it? We a hadn't had rain for weeks. It was a long, hot, dry period about this time last year, same as we're having now, really. And I thought, where better place to chant to Thor than in Thor's cave? So I was just gently, gently drumming, Thor, oh Thor, please send us some gentle rains. And it did. And it did. About, about two days later, OK, it took a bit of time to work. But it worked. Well, he is a god, after all. He'll do it in his own time. Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, and I noticed that there's a second entrance that the sun was shining through. And being the, the inner nerd in me came out. And I thought, we're just after the solstice. And the sun is going to come in through this narrow chamber just before it sets into the hill opposite. And so we stand in this side chamber. And it was a bit like Indiana Jones, you know, where he's waiting for the sun to come into the, to the map room. And we wait and we wait. And the sun appears. And then it fills the whole of this side chamber. And that will only happen at the solstice. And then uh, gradually, uh, as the sun moved around further, the beam got narrower and narrower and narrower. And in the end, the only thing the sun is shining on just before it set was this magnificent natural monolith with a huge light-colored or quartz block on the top. And that was incredible. So it's this thing about sacred time. Sometimes it's about being at the right place at the right time. If we'd have gone there a month afterwards or a month before, we wouldn't have got that experience. So clearly the site wanted us to pass it on. And from where we were down on the ground, we couldn't see that massive crystal on the top of that no. rock. We only saw it in the photograph when we got home. Yeah. So we've got to go back there and take a look. Oh, yes, yes. So Ramshaw Rocks near Leek is another great northern place. This, this wasn't even on our original list. We just came past it and saw these rocks on the road, and we thought we had to go up. And they are full. They're millstone grit, purples, reds. It's like being in the Australian outback. It really is an amazing place, full of huge rock giants. And uh, you know, let's say the millstone grit often, often weathers. It's a true dreamtime landscape. If you took an Aborigine up here, they would totally relate to it. And uh, the Two of the best places we find. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. So uh, we call this Buddha, uh, or um, Buddha, Buddha with a hangover. Buddha on a bad day. Yeah. <laughs> Buddha on a bad day. So uh, this is about uh, 40 feet high, this rock. This is ginormous. And the thing is, millstone grit weathers so slowly, that's why they use it for millstones, that this looked very similar thousands of years ago. Those simulacra I, I showed you on Dartmoor, the Dartmoor granite only weathers half a centimetre every 5,000 years. So therefore, everything we're showing you here would have looked virtually the same when our hunter-gatherer ancestors were coming. And I, I find that's really amazing. I found this, this rocking stone. All around the world, rocking stones are held as sacred. And with all my might, I just about managed to get it to uh, move about an inch. Looks a bit like an elongated head, I would say. Yeah. Oh, we're in the right place here, aren't we? Mm -hmm. Elongated heads. So another great place that some of you might have heard of is Ludge Church. And it's like walking into Jurassic Park, this narrow canyon several hundred meters long full of ferns and greenery and there's pinch points where the energies are really squashed in. It's as if, you know, you, you want to almost, is the rock going to squash me? Associated with Lud, Lug, the sun god, of course. And uh, this was a very special place. And we ended up by, we felt we had to do We, we processed procession. all the way through, went up to one end and, and drummed and chanted all the way through in a procession. Because somehow it felt as if it would something that would have been done in ancient times. So another place, again, is uh, in, some of you might have been to Dovedale. You know, you walk along the river there from the National Trust hut. You go across the little steps, the stepping stones across the river, and then most people usually turn down. But if you go further on, the, just off the beaten track, there's this huge arch, which must be 50 feet high. There's me down there, a massive arch. This really is like going into the... You can tell it's a right of passage pace. And if you scramble up the tops, um, up a 45 degree rubbly top, you actually come, it shows up in the book, there's actually a cave further on, that is your destination. And I hope it shows all right in the pictures, yes. Talk about Dementors, you know, this is the guardian spirit of the cave that you go in, uh, and the acoustics in there are amazing, but look at this, you couldn't... You know, when you go out on the landscape, you don't need Photoshop, it's, it's, it's all there for you. So uh, as often happens, I went sky clad. You know, who the hell can tell us that we can't take our clothes off when we feel like it? And knickers to that. So, uh, and this was really interesting, wasn't it? Or rather, no knickers to that, yeah. Um, so we found this just, this is a natural feature where, near the back of the cave. Again, talk about elongated heads. This was just a natural feature in the rock. It shows up better in the book. You can see it's, this head, this eye, the nose, the mouth. It's incredible. And it's probably looked like that since the Ice Age. This is the incredible thing. So all the shamans and people that were going in there through the hunter-gatherer and into the Neolithic were looking at the same head. 
and perhaps it was speaking, you know, when you were under the influence of this, that, and the other. Brimham, Brimham Rocks. Rocks. Oh. It's, again, it's a National Trust place, but it's, it's acres of incredible rocks in rock formations that are creatures of, of every kind you can possibly imagine. It's like a wonderland of rocks. We recommend it highly. Yeah, your, your totem, one of your totems is the bear, isn't it? And this is the dancing bear, it's they call the bear. this. And uh, this is called the Sphinx, but I think it looks all the world like a dragon skull. How about you? So the, uh, the beaky bit is there, and there's his eye, sunken eye. It just, oh, just an, your imagination goes wild when you go through this place. Um, it's a place where you can scramble into, I love scrambling into little claustrophobic faces. Call me weird places, <laughs> but... Um, uh, and, uh, you know, this, this is a, an amazing one, isn't it, Sue? That really the caught your imagination. Top, top left is the Druid's writing desk. But I think it looks more like E.T., don't you? Yes. Mm, thank you. Definitely, yeah. <laughs> the one on the right is actually a 200-ton rock called Idol Rock. Uh, and it's actually 200 tons is balanced on a pivotal bit of rock 18 inches across. So this is a leap of faith, isn't it, Sue? Mm -hmm. So Sue's on it. It actually looks as if I'm trying to push it over <laughs> while Sue's under there. That's, that's merely an illusion, I can assure you. So, um, but yeah, again, it's a rite of passage, you know. You know the, the shaman might have been there saying, go under there, dearie, or you'll be okay. And then she climbs up the top and is rocking the blooming thing. So if you stay underneath, then you've passed. So very initiate, initiatory landscape. The Malamaria. If you've never been there, go. Gordelskar is huge. It's these massive cliffs with the river running through that obviously over millennia has worn its way through the, the rock. Um, the cliffs there are probably over 200 feet high. Forget Cheddar Gorge. It's amazing. Yeah. And just took our breath away. This river then runs further down the valley and falls in across this waterfall called Janet's Foss. Beautiful place, little wooded glen um, where the water falls through. And Janet was, is actually the queen of the fairies. So this place, as you can imagine, it felt really magical. And you could, you could imagine lots of fairies coming out late at night to dance around. So you had a feeling, didn't you? Intuitively, you, you felt you had to go somewhere. I know, I know from experience, if Sue intuitively feels we need to do something, we do it. So you, Malham Cove is very nearby, isn't it? And you felt you had to go there mm. just at sunset. We, we were supposed to be heading back to the car to go back to our, our hotel. But I said, no, I, I can't leave here without seeing Malham Cove. And it'd been really teeming with, with lots of tourists earlier on. But it had gone quiet. The sun was starting to go down. So I said, quick, let, let's just go up the path and, and get a bit closer. Well, we got a bit closer, and I thought, mm, no, I've got to get closer still. And I just followed my intuition. We had the whole place to ourselves. It was that magical twilight time. There you are. Can you when, see? when all yeah. the nature spirits come out. And it was, the whole place was just tingling with magic. It was just an incredible experience. And then finally... We thought, we better go, it's getting dark. We didn't bring torches with us. And we turned and there was the full moon just rising to see us back to the car. It was another one of those really magical occasions. Sacred time. So the, the, we, there's several places in Northumberland. St Cuthbert's Cave is the most spectacular for me. It's really a rock shelter about 100 meters long held up by an impossibly narrow pivot of rock. <laughs> uh, and uh, it was a, St. Cuthbert, the famous Celtic saint, um, did a, had his hermitage there, and he was, his body was taken there uh, on the way uh, from east to west after he died. And uh, when we go there, we saw this rock. But when you get close to this rock, you actually realize there's a cleft right through it. And this felt like the entrance. It felt like we had to go in this way, which nobody else who came past did. They just waltzed straight into the, into the cave. And the cave is today used by uh, today's pagans, uh, you know, some uh, paintings and quite a lot of runes all over the place so, uh, have been chalked on. So it clearly is used today uh, by the local people. And uh, the acoustics underneath were quite fantastic. 
And uh, I had a bit of a moment, really. We call this drumming the dragon, and it's like being under the body of the dragon. Can you see its red, mm. its red claws there? And if we've, if we've perceived this, of course people perceived it as this thousands of years ago. There's no question about that. So, and as I'm looking out, I'm also looking at two other rocks which are in the book that are exactly like sleeping dragons, these two boulders. Uh, unbelievable. Yeah. So we were up Scotland, several Scottish places. Um, East Wemyss Caves, we went there with our good friends Gavin and Marie. Uh, you go in, there's five caves and where there's lots of Pictish carvings. But of course, wherever the Picts were, you can bet your life people were there beforehand, thousands of years before. The acoustics were amazing, weren't they? Yeah. And um, there's just a few examples. That's supposed to be Thor. That's supposed to be a fish. That's a bull. And I was interested in that one because I've very got a close connection with the wolf. So again, sorry these aren't as dark as they should be, but um, really were you were standing in the footsteps of the ancestors. Oh, yes. The Devil's Pulpit. Some of you might know this from, I think, Game of Thrones. It was one of the sets that mm. they used. So we, we went to visit. It's a very steep gorge. But can you see? Can you see him there? The green man looking over? Here's the pulpit, the shaman's table, we call it. And there's this six foot deep green man looking over the proceedings down in the gorge, which you can get down to. I'll give you a close up of him. So. Uh, most people probably walk straight past it and don't did, see that they? because they're just heading straight for the gorge. The spirit of the land is always expressing itself. In images, it wants you to perceive. That's the thing. So you get down there and wow, it's just... And the rocks yeah. really are that colour. It's this crimson sandstone. And it made, the look, it made it look as if the river was running red like blood. But again, yeah. I'm there blessing the water. The last place we're going to show you before we sum up is the praying hands, a natural formation, but what did our ancestors make of this? It's associated with a Fian, Fian McCool of Irish myths, and of course it's been Christianized into the praying hands of Mary. Uh, I, I can quite live with the praying hands of Mary Magdalene. That's, I can, okay, I, I, can, I can do that. But the She Heli and the Sacred Mountain of Scotland is, is right in the middle, and the landscape setting here is everything. It just takes your breath away. And there's another mountain right behind it that this is lined up with, Equinox Sunrise. The whole rocks are shot through with huge chunks of quartz, because this is ancient Precambrian rock with these huge, this is the oldest rocks on our, in our book. And uh, you did a bit of rock music, didn't you? I did, yeah. yeah. Didn't have my drum with me, but just started patting on the rock. As you can see, it's, it's quite fractured and, and laminated, this rock. And sometimes you get a little hollow behind. So just patting on it, you might occasionally find a bit that's a bit more resonant. So another bit more rock music to do. Yeah. So the chapter before we do the Gazetteer of 91 sites, we call a new vision for Albion. And, and for us, we go into detail. It's all about connecting and re-enchanting the land from the heart. It's all about intent. The landscape will know what your intent is when you roll up at a site. Uh, and to simplify, we've complicated everything. All religions have got complicated. We've complicated the goddess. We've complicated paganism. My word, you know. So we're as guilty as any, any of the, the, the other religions, you know. So simplify everything and uh, challenge yourself. Get out of your comfort zone, please, because that's often where the magic happens and receive the stories from the land, be receptive, and also be part of an awakening, you know, that Andy mentioned, you know, environmental activism. How can you be into the goddess and into the land if you're not also a bit of an eco-warrior? How does that work? Aren't we gonna fight for our mother? How can we revere and worship her? And then, uh, you know, even a simple act of picking up litter as you go up the high street is appreciated. So we've been suffering from cultural amnesia, big time, but we are now invited to retrieve ancient awareness from the mists of time, let's face it, in the nick of time. And sometimes a simple honoring is enough. So, so please seek out places where we awaken to dream time, to receive those fleeting moments of gnosis when outside becomes inside. Feel the sheer bliss, sensuality, and pure love 
that results from a deep connection with the land. Leave nothing behind but your love. What doesn't respond to love? So at this pivotal time, we are being, being called to re-enchant the land, to help heal it. And as we do, you know, it heals ourselves because we are part of the earth and potentially all of mankind. You know, and if we do create this sacred connection with the earth again, because when you think about it, if, if you love something, if you love something deeply, you will fight to protect it, won't you? You will fight with all your might to protect a loved one. So uh, that's where we've got to get. And then if we do, perhaps, just perhaps, there may be hope after all. It's a big perhaps. Uh, personally, we don't, you know, in terms of uh, anything in your life, really, conspiracies or anything you want to get into, personally, we don't waste time on what we cannot change in the world, you know, but we are passionate about, about what, what we, we can, can do. And that's the key. So let us walk gently across Albion, this sacred land of dragons, for the dragon is the land. It offers truth, mystery, and new frontiers. Let us be awakened dreamers. The spirit of Merlin, Arthur, and Albion sleeps within us all. So I want you to finish with uh, a little bit of audience anticip uh, anticipation. No, that was at, <laughs> that was at the other end. Participation. Participation even, yeah. Um, yeah, we're going to be here on our stall all weekend. Come, come and join us and have a chat with us. Uh, but we want you to, uh, that, that's a line from William Blake at the end. And what a great thing. And we want you to call it out with us. So on the count of three, we want you to do Awake and Albion Awake. Awake, Albion Awake, and let us awake together. You ready? You ready? Yes. Okay. One, two, three. Awake, awake Albion, Albion awake. awake, and, and let, let us, us awake, awake together. together. Thank you. Thank you.